It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. 1 John 1 9 states, If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. Therefore, as per our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving you the opportunity to be in fellowship. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. We pray that you will take the things that we note, make them a source of blessing and challenge in our life, and may God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to assemble this categorically in our souls. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Turning your Bibles to John 8.44. Still studying Satanology. Still studying Satanology. That is John eight forty four. For those listening on the internet, we lost power for about two hours today. And it looked as if we were going to have a candlelight message or a, uh, what do you call it, a lantern a lantern side message <laughs> or what uh, President Roosevelt would call it a fireside message but that's gay so now John 8.44 actually I meant to bring something and read it to you it's on the table out there it's a, it's a white paper it's from the Limbaugh letter you can bring all of the Limbaugh letter down here and it has to do with uh, a lot of what we're studying now, he comes at it from a human viewpoint, but we can look at it from a divine viewpoint. It's amazing what this smart fella comes up with named Rush Limbaugh. you think maybe he had heard some doctrine somewhere. You never know, however. That fella was my dad running across this thing. Now, look. Look here. This is uh, what uh, Rush Limbaugh has to say about what's happened to today's society. He calls it the feminization of society, but really what it deals with is uh, Satan's attempt to wipe out freedom of speech. You can only say certain things without offending people. You have to say those things that are appropriate and proper. And if you don't say those things that are appropriate and proper, somebody's going to get offended. And Rush Limbaugh writes about this. A very smart man, uh, but in terms of doctrine, who knows? But a very smart man anyway. And where he talks about liberals, you see, I don't want to get involved in politics. Where he talks about liberals, I'm going to insert the phrase cosmic system. And you'll see how close he comes to even understanding this. So here we go. It should come as no surprise that the cosmic system loathes to display any manly qualities. The cosmic system likes to moisten its fingers, stick it in the air, and follow whichever way the wind is blowing. Poles and majority opinion are their safety net, a way to re relieve themselves of any responsibility. The poles say this, the poles say that. They will take every position on an issue to avoid risking an unpopular one. Note that again. They will take every position on an issue to avoid risking an unpopular one. That's what most people do today. And then, of course, he goes into politics and talks about John Kerry. who says, I voted for it before I voted against it. It's a good way to avoid receipt but that's what did he, that's basically what did him in in the election though so what he has to say about uh, manliness is this and uh, actually it deals with leadership not manliness but this is how he refers to it but men and women alike know 
that manliness is defined by fearless leadership. Manly men are confident in their beliefs and are willing to take unpopular risks to assert those beliefs. Oftentimes this means going it alone. Rush Limbaugh wrote that. Having the courage to stand out in the wilderness unaccompanied. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul before he died. Everyone had abandoned him except Luke. He was basically unaccompanied. A manly man will not wait for the safety of consensus. A manly man will not wait for the safety of consensus to move forward. He is ready and willing to be the soldier in his army. Think John Wayne. When action is required, a manly man will not reply, Hold on, I need to take a survey. Manliness, you see, rejects a pack mentality. It embraces the kind of individuality and bold leadership that the cosmic system tries to neuter and suppress. Now he puts liberalism where I put cosmic system. They're one and the same. And that's a pretty good statement on leadership and how our culture has been emasculated, as it were. You can't say anything without offending people anymore. And that's, you know what that's the demise of? Freedom of speech. The First Amendment, by the way. Freedom of speech. You can't say this. You can't say that. If you say this, you'll get sued. Do you think our forefathers ever had the idea that if you said anything, no matter how crazy it was, that you would get sued for saying it? You see, in this country, we should have a freedom to say whatever we want, no matter how crazy it sounds. And there are crazy people out there who say crazy, stupid things. There are racists. There are people, and I don't agree with them, but there are racists, but I agree they have a right to be a racist. People fought and died for freedom of speech. And they can say the stupidest things they've ever, ever wanted to say. And yet today, we come down on freedom of speech. Well, that's all part of Satan's system. It's all part of Satan's attack on this nation. Now, as a prelude, let's look at John 8.44. 8.44. We did the prelude. Now let's get into it. John 8.44. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. That's you're in the cosmic system. You want to do the desires of of the devil. Now, you can be a believer, and what you are is antichrist. And you do want to do the desires of the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand for the truth because there is no truth in him. There's a lot of believers who don't stand for the truth, and there's no truth in them makes you wonder if their father is the devil but you see that's where it comes down you cannot distinguish an unbeliever from a believer in the cosmic system a believer in the cosmic system looks just like an unbeliever and while their father may not be the devil they are the enemy of the cross and that's what I was trying to get across a while back when I slipped up and said that uh, their father was the devil if you're a believer That can't be possible. But you can be an enemy of the cross. I may have to study that more just to make sure that is correct. Whenever he speaks a lie, from his own nature he speaks. That is Satan. And when we follow in Satan's system, whenever we speak a lie, from our old sin nature we speak. Because he is a liar and the father of lies. What this means is that when there is no doctrine of divine establishment truth circulating in your stream of consciousness, and that goes for believers or unbelievers. Again, whenever there is no doctrine of divine establishment circulating in your stream of consciousness, that goes for believer or unbeliever. You'll automatically lie. And that comes into under strong delusion in 2 Thessalonians, which we will study when we go over 2 Thessalonians. People believe the lie. Unbelievers and believers believe the lie. And when they do so, 
They reject establishment principles. When Satan is the mentor of anyone, and that happens, when you open up Matai Otes instead of being filled with the Spirit, you've made Satan your mentor. Now he has a great internet system, as I said. <coughs> now yesterday I said Satan was the inventor of the internet. Some idiot will take that uh, literally and say, oh, I can't be on the internet. Uh, Satan is the inventor of the internet. Wrong. I was making a point. Don't be stupid about a point. That was not. That was a figurative. That's called figurative language. Satan did not invent the internet. Neither did Al Gore. Neither of them invented the internet, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I was trying to explain to you that Satan has an internet system in which all over the world it acts as a web, ready to catch anyone who goes outside of divine establishment, who goes outside of divine truth as a believer. The power of the truth in your soul as a believer is one of the greatest factors that insulates you against the power of Satan. When you are positive toward doctrine, when you make Bible doctrine number one, I don't mean number two, number three, or number four. People have had that problem. They've gotten pretty frisky about, oh, I can't make it number one. It's got to be number two. I've got to do something else. I got to do something else and this and that. And a Bible doctrine, I can have Bible doctrine, but it's whenever I please. And that's not the way God designed it. And if you go in that direction, you don't have the power of truth. It is the power of truth in your soul as a believer that insulates you from Satan. That's why in James it says, Submit yourself to the Word and He'll flee from you. Doesn't mean you won't go through evidence testing. You sure, you sure will, but you'll... You'll go through it and win it, and after you win evidence testing, he'll flee from you. So Satan works through human beings who are liars. He has to has an he has to have an agent. We've studied that. We've studied how Satan has to have agents because he's not omnipresent. And he works through human agents who are liars. Second Thessalonians two, nine through ten. Turn there. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10 deals with liars. It deals with people who go in for what is not the truth. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10. I'm glad she didn't throw up in a briefcase. <laughs> I'll never be that tough. Let's see. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. This is a prophecy dealing with what's going to happen in the tribulation. With all power and signs and false wonders, and with every deception of unrighteousness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of for the truth, with the result that they might be delivered. These people were under the lie. And actually, this is a prophecy for the tribulation. And they will see the signs and wonders that Satan will produce, and they'll fall all over themselves. They'll love Satan. And they will fall for deception. They will fall for the lie. This is called strong delusion. And there is strong delusion today. Why does all the world hate Israel except half of America? Strong delusion. It is unreal to look around the world and see anti-Semitism in every part of the world except in this client nation, the United States, where there is anti-Semitism, but not as much. It's split about right down the middle. There's a bit more who aren't anti-Semitic, and then there are those who are anti-Semitic. And that's about uh, just a little less than half. But it doesn't take much for people to start changing their minds, especially with a media that constantly barrages you with lies and tells you how Israel's the enemy. Israel is not the enemy. Israel's the best ally we've ever had in all of human history. Forget Great Britain. Yes, they're our ally, but Israel is much closer to us than uh, Great Britain ever will be. They think like us. They're almost Anglo-Saxon, it appears, in their thinking. They are Jews, of course. 
So in Second Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10, it describes those who are under strong delusion, those who accept the lie over the truth. You could tell someone the truth and they'll accept the lie in a heartbeat. Now believers are deceived as easily as unbelievers in this satanic strategy. Unbelievers are deceived. Believers are deceived. And the phenomenal thing is, believers are deceived just as much as unbelievers, if not more. I would say 99%, if not more, of believers have been deceived by Satan's system. However, unbelievers, it might be even a less percentage because they go, some of them go on divine establishment. So it's phenomenal to see how many believers go for the lie. So believers are deceived as easily, if not more easily, than be unbelievers by the satanic strategy. Now we have two illustrations now of the satanic lie. First of all, socialism. Socialism. The basis of socialism in modern history goes back to uh, Sir Thomas More who wrote a book called Utopia. And Utopia was a place of social and political perfection. And Satan's whole agenda, since he's came on the earth, is to make perfect environment. He's tried to duplicate the millennium. He will always try to duplicate the millennium. The issue with Satan is not volition. The issue with God is volition. You choose. And uh, even Joshua made the, the, the uh, statement very uh, clear. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Choose, choice, volition. But Satan doesn't follow volition. He doesn't agree with that. He says volition has nothing to do with it because volition closes his case down. He says it's environment. That's why he went up to Job one time. And, or actually he saw Job as he went to and fro through the earth like a crazy man. He saw Job. And he went up to uh, God the Father in heaven. And uh, God the Father said, Have you seen Job, my servant? And Satan said, Yes, I have. And uh, then Satan made the statement, the only, way he, the only reason he serves you is because of the perfect environment you've given him. It wasn't perfect, but because of all the wonderful blessings you give him. That's the only reason he serves you. Satan's viewpoint is environment. Environment is what makes people do certain things. Not choice environment. He tries to say that volition has nothing to do with it. He tries to say that volition is handicapped either way by environment and that uh, if someone were rich, well, they would follow the Lord. In this case, he would say this. In the case of Job, he would say, Job is so rich, no wonder he follows you. You've made him rich. But Satan is such a liar. You know what he does in some cases? Oh, this person follows you because he has nothing else to do. He doesn't have any money. Let's give him a prosperity test. And I bet once we give this fellow a prosperity test and we change his environment from poverty to riches, he'll get arrogant and he'll forget all about you. And this is the way Satan thinks. It's environment that makes people choose the way they choose. But it's not. It's volition. It's all volition. Some people have been abused as children and have grown up to be fine people. Some people have been abused as children and have grown up to be criminals. Some people have never been abused and have grown up to be criminals. It has nothing to do with environment. But Satan says that and we all buy into it. Psychology buys into it. I studied psychology in college and that's what they bought into. It was environment. People do this and that because of their environment. People act this way because of their environment. Now there are environmental handicaps that all of us have to overcome. But how do we overcome it? Volition! That's not to say that environment doesn't have an impact. It does. But Satan says environment is the end all. Satan says if you've had a bad environment, you're going to be a bad person. If you've had a good environment, you're going to be a good person. God says volition is what counts. And that is what counts. And there have been people who have grown up under the most severe, terrible environments. And they've grown up to be wonderful people. It's not environment, Satan. It's volition. And this is where he will lose his case. So the reason, so he thinks environment is the big thing. So what does he come up with? He comes up with things like socialism. 
a utopian society. And this is a devil's lie. And he thinks that if uh, everyone makes the same wage and if everyone lives the same comfortable life, they'll all live happily. But that's not the way it works. People have volition. The way Satan thinks is that uh, if you just give a criminal a chance and if you try to re rehabilitate a criminal through environment, he won't be a criminal anymore. That's Satan's thinking and that's not the way it works. Spain, by the way, Spain has elected the most uh, liberal government probably in all of world history. And in Spain they have these gangs running around. Actually gangs that came from Chicago and they moved to Spain. And they have these gangs running around and they're killing people. And instead of arresting them they decided this. They said, you know what? They had a bad environment. No wonder they went into a gang. They all grew up under a poor environment. So what we're going to do as a government is legalize their gang and we're going to give them money and we're going to call them the cultural association of the Chicago gang something like that they really did this this is not a joke and uh, they said and uh, since we have uh, incorporated them into our society and have given them money and now that they are equal with everyone else now that they have a better environment they won't commit crime anymore and that's their thinking. They're going to have a rude awakening, I can tell you that. But that's satanic thinking. And Spain has fallen all over satanic thinking with this new government that they have. It's absolutely phenomenal. By the way, they pulled all their troops out of Iraq. And you know what happened? They got bombed. Environment is not the issue. So Satan goes in for this socialism what is socialism? Well, the theory of utopian socialism is a lie. It's an economic tinkering with the laws of divine establishment. One of the great geniuses of uh, the uh, 17th and 18th century was Adam Smith. Actually, 17th, maybe even a little earlier. Adam Smith, and he didn't come up with capitalism. You might go to school and they say he came up with capitalism. No, capitalism been around. He just figured out the system. And he said it's an invisible hand. Well, that's divine establishment. Supply and demand, etc. Capitalism takes care of itself. Sometimes there's economic upswings, sometimes there's economic downswings. And it's all part of capitalism. And capitalism is the greatest system ever created because it's created by God. And that's why this nation prospers. Capitalism. And it's under the laws of divine establishment. But Satan comes along with a false premise and he inculcates into society that if capitalism would voluntarily surrender its ownership of the means of production to the state that is the government will take over businesses or to the workers hand it over to the labor unions unemployment and poverty would be abolished that's Satan's thinking that's just one example of Satan's thinking and this is because that people do not understand that capital and investment creates jobs. Will somebody remove that phone? Do something with it? At any rate, the theory establishes slavery. And that is, socialism is slavery. And it actually makes the state the slave owner rather than having the freedom of self-determination. The freedom for yourself to own your own business. The freedom for yourself to build your own capitalism. Well, that's just, or own capital and make your own business. But that's just one example called socialism, which is part of a satanic lie. Just an illustration, there are many more. Christian activism is one of them. Christian activism. The devil himself, Satan himself, sponsors Christian activism so that he can make Christians, believers in Christ, whitewash his own world. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11.3. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Again, Christian activism is an evil. 
When you see parents drag out their young kids and have them hold up signs against abortion, that is evil. They don't even understand the issue yet. They're trying to whitewash the devil's world. And do you know why so many people in this country make fun of Christians? It's because we deserve it! You know why when you turn on the comedy channel and what, what do they laugh at? Christianity. And why? We deserve every bit of it. All you have to turn, it, turn on is channel 6 and I get a laugh out of it sometimes because it's so ridiculous. And so Satan actually uses these people in Christian activism and it turns off a lot of the world. This Christian activism, it's nothing but Garbage. Second Corinthians eleven three. But I am afraid, lest as the serpent that Satan deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds, that is, your thinking, your thinking should be led astray from the purity and virtue which belongs to Christ. Purity again. There's that word. I've actually made a connection with that word with 1 John 1 9. Purity. Kafarizo means purify. Purity. What's it mean? What does that mean there in 2 Corinthians 11 3 when it says, You've been uh, led astray from the purity? The purity is you are not in the cosmic system. You're in the divine dinosphere. You're filled with the spirit. The purity deals with the unique spiritual life. It means you've been purified from the cosmos. Again, 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Afiemi. A whole different word. Forgive. Afiemi. Our sins. And to purify, a whole nother word, katharizo. And to purify us from all wrongdoing. What is the wrongdoing? Cosmic involvement. You understand when you sin and you can name a sin, but most believers don't understand when they get in cosmic involvement. But, as soon as, but let's say you've been in cos, cosmic involvement. As soon as you name your sin to God, you're forgiven not only of your known and unknown sins, you're also forgiven for being in the cosmic system and you're jerked right out of it. That's purity. Purified from the cosmic system. So that means your thinking should be again, but I am afraid lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your thinking should be led astray from the purity. That is from the divine dinosphere. That is from the power sphere. That is from the unique spiritual life which means you've gone into the cosmic system. And virtue! Where do you learn virtue and values? Bible class. Which belongs to Christ. What does that mean? Purity and virtue belongs to Christ. That means that in the prototype spiritual life, Jesus Christ lived it perfectly. He was always pure. He never went into the cosmic system. All of us do from now now and again. Hopefully we get we get out fast enough that it doesn't affect us. But Jesus Christ lived in purity outside the cosmic system and he had virtue. Personal love for God, impersonal love for mankind, that's called the virtue envelope. And it belongs to Christ, meaning he lived the prototype. He's given to us the protocol so we can do the same thing. We can get out of the cosmic system simply by rebound. But what Paul says in 2 Corinthians is, I'm afraid you've been deceived by the cosmic system. You've been deceived by Satan just as Eve was deceived by Satan and his craftiness. You've gone into the cosmic system just as Eve did. Therefore, you've become an agent of Satan just as Eve became an agent of Satan. And your thinking has been led astray from purity. Purity, again, is living outside the cosmic system. So truth, Bible doctrine, brings purity and virtue to the unbeliever and believer. Again, 
This might sound a bit odd, you say, to the unbeliever. Truth brings purity and virtue to the unbeliever and believer respectively. Now how does a, an unbeliever have anything to do with truth? Remember the three categories of truth? When they function under divine establishment, they are not a reversionistic unbeliever. They belong to one category of truth, divine establishment. Therefore, they're not in reversionism as an unbeliever. An unbeliever goes into reversionism how? By rejecting the gospel. Now, I taught this before, and I taught it... I didn't explain it very well, and if I had an overhead, I would explain it better right now, but I'll go ahead and uh, try to explain it to you without the overhead. What happens to the unbeliever? Let's say the unbeliever is functioning under the first category of truth called divine establishment. And he functions in which he loves his country, he loves his family, he loves his job, he loves his wife. He functions normally. And you, many, many believers would look at an unbeliever such as that and say, well, he must be saved, but he's not. Now what happens? Such an unbeliever comes in contact with the gospel. God the Holy Spirit then takes this unbeliever who is living in cosmic in the cosmic system. He has to. He always does as a sinner. You, you, as an unbeliever, you can't. You are always in the cosmic system. The one who lives by divine establishment truth is in cosmic one, however. Meaning he doesn't hate it. Meaning if he heard the gospel, he wouldn't hate hearing the gospel. Cosmic one. But an unbeliever is always in Cosmic One. Before I made a mistake on that, nobody caught it except one person. But the fact is an unbeliever is always in the Cosmic System. The unbeliever that functions under divine establishment functions under Cosmic One. Meaning he's not going to be adverse to hearing the Gospel. He's not going to throw a fit and say, I don't even want to hear it. He might even be open to the Gospel, Cosmic One. But then, when he hears the gospel, God the Holy Spirit acts as a human spirit because the unbeliever, remember, doesn't have a human spirit to teach his soul. So God the Holy Spirit acts as a human spirit. You see, he's spiritually dead. He needs a helper, God the Holy Spirit. And for a moment, God the Holy Spirit pulls this unbeliever out of the cosmic system. And as he is residing out of the cosmic system, for the first time he can understand the gospel. And God the Holy Spirit explains to him the gospel. Even though a preacher is standing up giving the gospel or an evangelist, God the Holy Spirit is the one explaining it to this unbeliever soul through acting as a human spirit. And so for a moment, maybe even a split moment, that unbeliever is outside of the cosmic system. Now he has a choice to make. Either believe in Christ and remain outside of the cosmic system, at least for a while, or reject Christ. Now when that unbeliever decides to reject Christ after he's been pulled up, this is found in Second Peter, after he's been pulled up out of the cosmic system, and is now functioning in the divine dinosphere because he understands it. And then if he rejects it, that unbeliever immediately falls from cosmic one to cosmic two. And his later condition is worse than his first. Meaning now that he's rejected the second category of truth, doc, uh, the gospel. He will now begin to reject the first category of truth, which is divine establishment. And he will go from a wonderful conservative to a flaming liberal overnight. And that explains it. It explains many people in, who have changed so quickly who are unbelievers. They've heard the gospel. They've rejected it. Then they went into cosmic two. Now again, the three categories of truth, divine establishment, number one. Number two is the gospel. Number three is Bible doctrine. Of course, if you reject the gospel, you'll never get to number three. And if you reject the gospel, you've just rejected the first divine establishment truth as well. That's why Second Peter says, Your latter status will be worse than when you first started. Now, for those of us who know Peter, Peter wrote that. Now, that's very technical, isn't it? And Peter wrote it. <laughs> now, that should be an encouragement to us. Peter understood it. 
Peter understood the cosmic system. But understand this. Even though Peter understood the cosmic system, and even though he understood that an unbeliever could would be worse would become worse off after he rejected the gospel, which most believers don't understand today. Even though he knew all of that, he still said, Paul knows more than me. And he was very technical in that. So just imagine the technicality of Paul. And when we go through Ephesians, which will be a while, I need, it's so technical, I need some time to study up on it. But uh, when you get to Ephesians especially, which is about the... A greatest epistle in the Bible. Once you get to that, you will see the technicality of Paul, and you'll see why Peter said, Go to Paul. Go to Paul. So if uh, anyone rejects this ministry, go to Colonel Thane. You can't go to Paul. He spoke Greek. Nobody knows Greek. Go to Colonel Thane. And uh, he definitely knew a lot. A lot more than I do. So, truth brings purity and virtue to the unbeliever and believer, respectively. Now, truth also causes Satan to flee. When you submit to Bible doctrine, Satan will flee you. Oh, you may be tested in evidence testing in which Satan attacks you, but guess what? He'll flee you if you stick with doctrine. Turn to James 4, 7. James 4, 7 explains this. That would be James 4, 7. Since the air has been out, it's very warm in here, so... That's why I'm sweating. The electricity's been out, that is. James 4, 7 says this. Submit, therefore, to God. You know, James, the book of James is quite phenomenal. He brings out a lot of the things that... Well, he had a congregation full of legalists. And do you know the only thing he could do while he was in fellowship at this point? James, by the way, died a loser believer, which is terrible. The half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ died a loser believer. That shows family ties has nothing to do with anything. Some people think, well, a family tie, well, if uh, you're positive and uh, your wife's positive and you have a child, they're going to be positive? Not necessarily. Definitely not necessarily. If it happens, it's God's grace. Believe me. And definitely God's grace because most families, they are all split up because some are positive and some are negative. Sometimes the husband is positive, the wife is negative. Sometimes the husband and wife are positive and uh, both children are negative. Sometimes one child is positive, the other child is negative. Very rarely do you find a family where everyone's positive. Very rarely. And if you happen to be in that category, well, that's you've been graced out. So James 4, 7 says, Submit therefore to God. Submit humility. James himself talks about humility, humility, humility. And he had to beat it into the brains of those legalists he was teaching. And boy, was he ever teaching a bunch of legalists and he taught so many legalists, he went that way himself. He could not handle the pressure. And he started to compromise with his congregation. You know what happened? He got a congregation of up to about 10,000 people, and there were 10,000 legalists he was teaching, and they would be offended if he taught anything about grace. So James stopped teaching grace. And James is the one who said this. God makes war against the arrogant believer, but he gives grace to the humble believer. James said that. Where'd he go? He went right into arrogance later on in life. Now the epistle is an epistle, and when he wrote it, he was filled with the Spirit. Some people like to rip out the book of James and say that's not part of Scripture. That's because it seems to contradict Paul, but it's not a contradiction. 
It's dealing with experiential sanctification versus positional sanctification. Those are theologically technical terms, but something you may understand. Positional sanctification, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Experiential sanctification comes from your spiritual life. And the only thing the book of James says is live your spiritual life. And what James really focuses on is stop gossiping, stop maligning, stop judging, and start living your spiritual life. And that's what James focused on in his book, mainly. And then he said, and then he started talking about producing the fruit of the Spirit, which has to do with producing divine good through living in the divine dinosphere. James even understood all of that. He understood humility very well. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Notice there's no offensive action. There's no offensive action against the devil. There's nothing offensive we can do to the devil. We could cuss him out all day long. It means nothing. We could sling punches at the air and say, I'm going to get you, devil. I've seen preachers do that. I'm going to get you, devil. Sling punches in the air, and everybody says, Amen, hallelujah. It's meaningless because it's defensive action, not offensive. Resist. Resist is defensive. What's defensive? Your flat line, your ten problem-solving devices. And you resist the devil. That is, he may throw all types of spears and arrows at you, especially in evidence testing, and you resist it. And if you resist the devil, he'll flee from you eventually. So Christian activism combines the arrogant skills with legalism. That is self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. And they come up with temporary problem or temporary solutions to problems. They're actually symptom shadow boxing. They look at our country and say our country's falling apart. What we need to do is go out and be activists. What we need to do is pass out flyers for certain of our politicians. What we need to do is stop abortion. What we need to do is stop the sale of liquor. What we need to do is this, that, and the other. And what are they doing? Whitewashing the devil's world. And the devil sit back and claps for them. You go, my servants. It's sad, but that's the way most believers go today. Christian activism. And they have temporary solutions to the problems of life, but they don't have the spiritual solutions. And why not? They don't want them. If they wanted them, it's available. It's available now more than it's ever been available before. It's available on MP3. It's available on video. It's available on uh, in, at, at, at a few internet sites. It's available. Colonel R.B. Theme has 11,000 hours of Bible teaching available. And all you have to do is order free of charge. I'm approaching 400 hours available, free. No charge. Free of charge sounds funny. It's just plain free. It's free from the Colonel. It's free from me. It's free from, uh, as far as I know, Joe Griffin. It's free from Albany Bible Doctrine Church, where we went. It's free there. And, and what is it called? Bobby, of course. Bobby in Houston, it's free there. And uh, there is a lot of doctrine out there that and, uh, apparently people don't want it. And why are we under the five cycles of discipline? For that reason. So Paul's warning against the arrogant skills is found in Romans 12, 2 through 3. What is the fastest way for you to fall under Satan's cosmic system? Arrogance. Romans 12, 2 through 3 explains this. Arrogance. And by the way, I don't change up what I teach because of a, a little mishap here and there. I was going to teach this many days ago. And actually I've taught Romans 12, 2 through, through, 2 through 3 many times. Romans 12, 2 through 3. Stop being conformed to this world. What's that mean? Get out of the cosmic system. Stop living 
in the cosmic system. Stop being conformed to the cosmic system. But be transformed. How? By the renovation of your thinking, not emotion. The spiritual life has nothing to do with emotion. The Bible explains that explicitly time after time after time. There is nowhere in the Bible that says, get emotional for me. A lot of uh, the holy rollers like to bring up David. Well, look how he danced in the street naked. How, how he praised the Lord in that way and danced in the street naked. And you tell me, I can't get up and dance for the Lord? You don't have enough doctrine! You are so arrogant to compare yourself with David on the one hand. And secondly, you don't have enough doctrine to dance for the Lord. You're dancing for the cosmos. You don't have enough doctrine to understand and to appreciate as David appreciate, appreciated his spiritual life. And by the way, when David danced for the Lord, it was after a great victory in battle. It was not at a church service and he didn't do it at the synagogue while Samuel was teaching. It's a whole different situation. And these people are idiots anyway. They wouldn't listen to me, so why even bother? But the fact is, it's your thinking. As Romans 12, 2 through 3 says, why do I have to say anything? The Bible says it. By the renovation of your thinking. You might have the word thought, but it's thinking. And what is the renovation of your thinking? You begin to the develop the thinking of Christ, who lived the prototype. Now you're living the protocol. It's very simple. You know, all these terms might seem, for some people, a bit tough, but once you put it together in a system, it's very simple. God makes it very simple for all of us. That you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good, divine good, good of intrinsic value, and acceptable, and perfect. For I say through the grace which has been given to me to everyone who is among you, stop thinking of self in terms of arrogance beyond what you ought to think. Corrected translation by Colonel R.B. Thing. Absolutely a phenomenal translation, but absolutely what it says. Stop thinking of self in terms of arrogance beyond what you ought to think, but think in terms of Sanity! You might have the word sobriety. That is the dumbest translation ever. There are drunk people who think better than some of these Christians out there. It's not sobriety. It's sanity. Sanity! And there are people who are insane and don't know it. It's a sad thing. They need to get on medicine. But think in terms of sanity. Sanity! For the purpose of being rational without illusion. They have illusions about themselves. They walk around thinking and dreaming about themselves in terms of greatness. That's part of insanity. They daydream and think of themselves in terms of the world bowing to them. Or think of themselves as being great. Comparing themselves with other people. You as a believer have no right to compare yourself with someone else. You are to serve God Almighty, not other people. Who cares what other people are doing? What was it that Rush Limbaugh said? It's time to be a manly man, right? If you have to go it alone, go it alone. But men and women alike know that manliness is defined by fearless leadership. I'll read it again because it's actually wonderful. Manly men are confident in their beliefs and are willing to take unpopular risks to assert those beliefs. That's leadership. Now the arrogant will never do this. The arrogant want what? Approbation lust. The arrogant will never go out on a limb. They do what is proper. They do what is appropriate. Just as... Adam and Eve did what was appropriate when they fell into the cosmic system. They put on a fig leaf and both of them figured to each other this is appropriate and this is proper. 
But God was not impressed. So manly men are confident in their beliefs. Oftentimes this means going it alone. Having the courage to stand out in the wilderness unaccompanied. Now I know Rush Limbaugh is a believer. Wherever he got this divine establishment principles and wherever he got these leadership principles, I'll never know. I wish I did know. But it, it, it's becoming obvious to me that he, he's got it from uh, he's got it from uh, somebody, maybe his best friend, who knows. He's got it somewhere because you can't you would have to be a super genius like, like Napoleon to come up with things like that. So maybe Rush Limbaugh is a super genius. Liberals would hate to hear that, but it's it's true. If he came up with that on his own, without any help, he's the Napoleon of our era. Most definitely. Napoleon understood divine establishment as an unbeliever. And Napoleon turned Europe upside down as an unbeliever. And he gave Europe freedom as an unbeliever. And he understood marriage. And he understood nationalism. And he understood all the uh, basics of divine establishment. Which means probably Napoleon was never exposed to the gospel because he never wanted it. So this is Paul's warning against arrogance, not to go off on a tangent. For I say through the grace that has been given to me to everyone who is among you, stop thinking itself in terms of arrogance beyond what you ought to think, but think in terms of sanity for the purpose of being rational without illusion, as God has assigned to each one of us a standard of thinking from doctrine. Think doctrine. Think doctrine. Think doctrine. Think doctrine. Not emote. Think doctrine. Most people want to go with the details of life. Think academics. Think this. Think that. Well, Solomon went all in for academics. Solomon went all in for sex. Solomon went all in for everything. And he was he went absolutely into the cosmic system. His father taught him very well, but Solomon went into the cosmic system. But he recovered. After he had tried everything, Oh, he tried all the religions, too, of the day. And he was with every woman who worshipped every other god in the world. And he would worship those gods with those women. And he went through all the religions. And he went through all the academics. And he could name you every animal species on the earth. He could name you every species of flower, plant, and grass. If he were around today, he could uh, go outside here in his own language, of course and just tell you what everything was around here. Well, that's a so-and-so flower budding up. And that's a so-and-so there. And he was a genius and very wise in the ways of the world especially. And then finally he said, it's meaningless. I'm not happy. He got back with doctrine in his old age. So the basis for all satanic religions has always been based on asceticism. This is a point you might want to write down. The basis for all satanic religions has always been asceticism. What is asceticism? Human sacrifice. Not sacrificing a human, but in terms of you, sacrificing. You must sacrifice something. You must give up something. You must do this and that in order to be part of a religion. And that's what separates Christianity from religion. Absolutely, because in Christianity there's no name under heaven given among men by which man can be saved except Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's Christianity. Religion says do this, do that, stop doing this and stop doing that. So the basis for all satanic religions has always been sacrifice. Human sacrifice in terms of asceticism. And the basis of this is a sad satanic lie. You cannot work your way over the barrier between God and man. Impossible. So activism is a way of thinking of self in terms of arrogance. And believers who have already believed in Christ go into activism. What are they doing? Asceticism. Sacrifice. I'm doing this for the Lord, they will say. The Lord's done everything for you, idiot. 
The only thing you have to do is follow his system. And people and believers don't understand that. They think in terms of insanity. They don't think in terms of truth. But we must think in terms of sanity, and that is to think in terms of truth. Now we have the inscrutable question coming up, which is a whole different subject. A very interesting subject if you haven't gone over it before. The inscrutable question. And if everybody's willing and they don't have nothing to do, we'll have a break and get back with it. Dallas will be here by then. We can have another one on the inscrutable question. The inscrutable question. And this is something that my pastor taught right before he went into Alzheimer's. And uh, I believe it might be in the 1800s or maybe 1600s of spiritual dynamics. I'm not quite sure. But it has only been taught by him once. He taught it differently when he was younger, but he came up with some things. He was learning doctrine all the way up till Alzheimer's stopped him from learning anymore. And he actually broke through the inscrutable question. All theologians said, what, what I'm about to teach, all the theologians said, this is inscrutable. We can't, we can't tell you exactly how this came out. It's inscrutable. And then Colonel Thames said, you know, if it's in the Bible, it's not inscrutable. I'm going to figure it out. And he did. And it makes perfect sense, of course. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. May we avoid the cosmic system and maintain the filling of the Spirit as much as we can through rebound and keep moving. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.